Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. If it's your birthday, happy birthday. <sighs> Today we're going to be talking about child trafficking. So trigger warning, we're going to be talking about child trafficking, abuse. My iron's ready. So if it triggers you, you know, go ahead and leave the video. Georgia Tan was a woman who was born in 1891 and died September 15th, 1950. She was an American child trafficker who operated the Tennessee Children's Home Society, an adoption agency in Memphis, Tennessee. She used the unlicensed home, and I'm trying to read this, hold on. She used an unlicensed home as a front for her black market baby adoption scheme from the 1920s until a state investigation into numerous instances of adoption fraud began perpetrated, being perpetrated by her closed institution in 1950. Georgia died of cancer before the investigation made its findings public. Georgia's custom of placing children when influential members of society normalized adoption in America and many of her adoption practices often designed to hide the origin of her adoptees became a standard practice. Now, I'm not going to get all into her background because I'm not giving her no sympathy of nothing. This woman ripped children from good families. She ripped children from parents who loved them who could provide for them, and she took children from parents who were poor and didn't have the most, you know, who had little food, but they did want their kids. They didn't want to lose their children. She, she would snatch children from people who were middle class. She was giving children, selling children, you know, on the black market and in public too, to celebrities, to tons of people, rich people, you know, middle class people, she was making so much money. For back then, it was a ton of money. You know, nowadays it would it would be considered millions, basically. Her practices of how she went about this is so disturbing. And it's even sadder that she never got punished for any of it. She lived out her life. Some of the victims, you know, have told their stories, and it is brutal. Some of these children went through so much once Georgia took them away from their parents. And Georgia would write down on some of the children's paperwork that she was taking them because they were being abused, um, starved. She would claim that a woman's baby had died, you know, was a stillborn or had died at birth. And they would tell the mother that her baby had died and they would steal the baby and sell it on the black market. She was that kind of bitch. Yeah. Georgia... She would find, like, underage girls, young mothers, basically. They were her biggest target. And when she would find out that they had applied for any kind of benefits, she would find their name and their address or what doctor they were going to and forge paperwork. And by the time they had their baby, she was either taking the baby out their arms, she was either telling them it was stillborn, or she was telling them to put it up for adoption because they couldn't take care of it or because they were, you know, not married or because they had been, you know, raped or whatever the reason may have been, she'd take their baby. There was nothing they could do. She would forge and get their doctor to sign a paper saying that they were whatever she said. A lot of cases, Georgia would claim that the parents, married or not, were poor, unstable, abusive, whatever she wanted to say and she would go take their children. Their children could be flown across the country. They could be flown to another, um, another country and never seen or heard from again. Their parents never seen them again. There was only you know, a few cases to where a child was old enough to remember or a parent was able to find their child in their new home and try to take them back. But as far as taking her to court, never happened. No judge would touch her, and she had a couple of judges in her pocket. It makes me feel so bad, too, because a lot of these parents who spoke out after everything went on, a lot of them either didn't know their kids were alive because they were told they were stillborn. A lot of them hadn't seen them since she ripped them out of their arms, claiming they were poor or unstable or abusive or whatever. A lot of the parents searched and searched high and low and could never get a hold of any kind of paperwork. You know, they had the kids' names changed. 
just and back then it was easy to get away with stuff like that it was easy to disappear georgia had a lot of accomplices she had a lot of people in her back pocket including some very higher up people and that's why she was able to get away with all of this but let's talk about a couple of these stories so in memphis Georgia was hired as an executive secretary at the Shelby County branch of Tennessee Children's Home Society. It offices were, um, its offices were located on the fifth floor of the Goodwin Building downtown. The society was the largest in the state and had branches in Jackson, Knoxville, Chattanooga. Georgia used aggressive tactics to eventually take over the organization. In 1924, Georgia began trafficking children. While Tennessee law permitted agencies to place children with appropriate applicants in an effort to ban the selling of children, agencies could charge only for their services. In keeping with the law, the society charged about $7 for adoptions within Tennessee. However, Georgia also arranged for out-of-state private adoptions where she charged a premium. As many as 80% of these adoptions were to parents in New York and California. Records indicate that between 1940 and 1950, the agency had placed over 3,000 children in those just those two states. Now, she did a ass load more. Off the books, behind closed doors, in other states, we're talking hundreds of thousands of children. Anywhere from the ages, you know, 15 and younger, to one-day-old babies. Some babies, as soon as they would come out from their mama literally come out of their mama they would snatch it some babies were born premature and instead of waiting until the average back then was when they gained five pounds they could go home georgia wouldn't do that as soon as that girl had that baby premature or not she was taking it and a lot of times the baby would die a lot of times the adoptive parents who were buying the child would be like this is a premature baby it's no bigger than my hand georgia didn't care she did not care. It was about what she wanted, and she wanted her money. Several people reported her. It did no good. She had judges in her back pocket. She had police officers in her back pocket. It's one of those stories that has such a horrible ending because she didn't get no punishment. And most of the kids did not get reunited with their families. You know, it's just... But I feel like we have to share awareness because CPS and black market adoption agencies... Are still pulling this crap today they are still selling children on the market today yes it still happens especially like children with uh, disabilities um, children who are babies or up to five years old are being shipped across this world like like a, like a, uh, a gift from Amazon they're just shipping them left and right it's crazy so let's see while Tennessee law permitted agencies to place children uh, let's let's go back to this part. Alma Walton and Regina Warner both worked for Georgia and made a trip every three weeks with four to six babies in tow. Walton to California, Warner to New York. They would rent hotel rooms where they would meet with prospective adoptive parents, most of whom were wealthy. Each couple would pay U.S. $700 in a check made out to Georgia Tan. Additionally, Georgia might charge prospective parents for background checks she had never pursued, air travel, air travel cost, um, exorbitant rates, and adoption paperwork at five times the actual cost. The state of Tennessee itself was contributing $61,000 a year to the agency with 31% of that money going towards the Memphis branch. She was pocketing so much money. And they didn't do anything because she was paying all these crooked-ass judges and police officers to be in her back pocket. Profits were kept in a secret bank account under a false cooperation name. Um, at that time, adoptions in states such as Mississippi, Arkansas, Missouri could be arranged for $750. Y'all, that was a lot of money back then. That was an ass load of money back then. It is alleged that she pocketed 80 to 90% of the fees from these adoptions of uh for her own personal use. She also failed to report the income of to either the society board or the IRS. In 1979, interview with uh, LA Times, Tennessee Special Prosecutor Robert Taylor reported that 1,200 children were adopted out of the home between 1944 and 1950, but only a few of them remained with Tennessee families. 
notable personalities who used George's services included actress Joan Crawford. We seen how that went. She didn't do background checks. And when she knew these people were abusing these kids, she didn't go save them. She didn't let them leave. They were forced to stay with these abusive homes who worked them like slaves, who sexually raped them and abused them in many, many ways. It's just, it's, it's going to get disturbing. Notable personalities who used Georgia's service, uh, services included Joan Crawford, twin daughters Kathy and Cynthia were adopted through the agency, while daughter Christina Crawford and son Christopher were adopted through other agencies. June Allison and husband Dick Powell also used Memphis-based home for adopting a child, as did the adoptive parents of professional wrestler Ric Flair. New York Governor Herbert Lehman, who signed a law sealing the birth certificates from New York adoptees in 1935, also adopted a child through the agency. And that's what's worse, is these kids and these parents had no way to find any of these children's backgrounds. She would forge the birth certificates to what she wanted. So they could never find out where they came from or who their birth parents actually were. Y'all, some of these people were buying children. They knew what was going on. A lot of people were buying them as farmhands or for slaves, sex slaves. They were assaulting them, abusing them. So there was a few who actually got good homes. Still and all, it's, it's horrible. And like I said, she was going to hospitals it was to the it got so bad that some of the hospital nurses who didn't work for her would actually hide the prettier babies because they knew that's what she was after. They would hide them until she left. So she wouldn't take none of the babies. Some of the hospitals would call her because she was giving them, you know, a little bit of that paper and they would say, Hey, we got this baby, that baby, you know, this girl, she just had another baby, she's got four babies that she can't take care of. Go get her kids and they would work together and take people's children. She used a, a variety of methods to pro, uh, procure children through pressure tactics, threats of legal action, and other ways. She would dupe or coerce birth parents, mostly poor single mothers, to turn the children over to her custody, often under false pretenses. Alma Simple is one of Tan's victims. Described as a stern-looking woman with close-cropped gray hair, round wireless glasses, and an utterly authority, Tan also arranged for the taking of children born to inmates at Texas, Tennessee mental institutions and those born to wards of the state through her connections. To meet the demand, she resorted to kidnappings. She took babies from prisons, mental institutions, hospitals, through CPS. She pulled up to a woman's house, pulled up to the back door, seen a kid out there playing, went in there and took it and left with it. Yes, that's this is the kind of person we're talking about right now. She physically kidnapped children and paid other people to kidnap children too. In some cases, single parents would drop their children off at the nursery schools only to be told that welfare agents had taken the children. In, yeah, that's messed up. You taking your kid to daycare so you can go to work. You come back from work and your kid's gone because CPS came and took your child? Wouldn't that be messed up? And there's nothing you can do, nothing at all that you can do. In others, children will be temporarily placed in an orphanage because a family was experiencing an illness, unemployment, no food, um, only to find out later that the orphanage had adopted them out or had no record of the children ever being placed there. Georgia was also documented as taking children born to unwed mothers at birth, claiming that the newborns required medical care. When the mothers asked about the children, Georgia or her accomplices would explain that the babies had died when they had actually been placed in foster homes or adopted. That's so sad. Tan destroyed the records of children who were processed through the society and conducted minimal background checks on the adoptive homes. And that's why so many of them were abused, tortured, and raped, and some dead. A lot of them died. We're going to get to that, too. As a result, the Child Welfare League of America dropped the society from its list of qualifying institutions in 1941. Many of the files of the children were fictionalized before being presented to the adoptive parents, which covered up the child's circumstances prior to being placed with the society. Now, this woman, Georgia, would also make newspaper ads, like little advertisement you see like selling a car, selling a house, 
things like that. Yeah, that kind of newspaper ad. She would actually put in the paper, blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl, I'm lonely. Do you want to meet me? Would you love to be my new daddy, my new mommy? Or, don't I look just like a baby doll? Wouldn't you love to have a new baby doll? Do you need a Christmas baby? Wouldn't you love to have a new Easter baby? She would do ads like that and put it in the paper. And of course, people everywhere were seeing these ads and they were running. And not just people who couldn't have kids. This was people, your pedophiles, who knew they could get a child like that. A few hundred dollars, sometimes less. If they knew they could trade with her, you know, hey, I know where some kids at that you can get if you'll get me one. She would do those things. When an adoptive parent discovered that the information on the child was incorrect, such as the case of falsified medical histories, Georgia often threatened the adoptive parent with the possible legal action that would force a surrender of their children. Georgia's crimes were accomplished with the aid of Memphis Family Court Judge Camille Kelly. That was a judge in her back pocket who used her position of authority to sanction Georgia's tactics and act activities. Georgia would often identify children as being from homes which could not provide for their care, and Kelly would push the matter through the dockets. Kelly also severed custody of divorced mothers, divorced fathers, single mothers, single fathers, veterans with children, placing the children with Georgia, who then arranged for adoption of the children into homes better able to provide for the children's care. However, many of the children were placed into homes where they were used as child labor on farms or with abusive families where children were mentally, physically, and sexually abused. In a letter drafted in 1947, Georgia's attorney, Abe Waldler, said that the prospective adoptive couple had complete custody and control of a child for one year, may submit the child to any physical or mental examination they wish and take any steps they may desire to assertion that they have a healthy and normal child. If it is not, the Tennessee Children's Home takes it back without question. Bypassing Shelby County Probate Court, most of the adoption cases were handled in the counties of Dyer, Haywood, and Hardin, Hardman. Georgia also had connections with former tennis mayor E.H. Boss, Crump, they called him Boss, who continued to have influential political presence until his death. He had, been long, he had long been known to take bribes from unlawful establishments, brothels, gambling halls, a fact which Georgia used to her advantage. She enjoyed a lavish lifestyle and was widely respected in the community, counting among her friends, prominent families, politicians, and legislators. While in her care, Georgia mistreated the children, she abused the children, with reports of neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and murder. With no housing facilities, the society held children awaiting placement in public facilities and foster homes. In the 1930s, Memphis had the highest infant mortality rate in the nation, largely due to Georgia Tan. That's awful. In 1943, a wealthy businessman donated at the mansion at 1556 Poplar Avenue to the society. The offices and intake rooms were put on the bottom floor while the nurseries were upstairs. Donated a mansion. If this place had been legit, that could have helped so many kids. If they had done this the right way. They donated a freaking mansion. They, the government gave them so much money every year and gave Georgia so much money. And, sorry, my face is itching and donations, and the bribes, and the money that she stole and embezzled, and the charities. She got so much money. And these children suffered, not just being, you know, just trafficked, but mentally, physically, sexually abused, and some murdered. Some died of starvation and neglect. You're taking these kids to put them in a better home for a better life, and then they're dying? The all-female staff wore all-white nursing uniforms despite the fact they were mostly untrained and even substance abusers. The children were frequently sedated and those who were difficult to place were allowed to die of malnutrition. Like China's dying room for little girls. China has a room called a dying room and it's where they leave their girls, baby girls, to die of starvation. We're going to do a video on that too. Another video. 
Ten, Georgia Ten regularly ignored doctors' recommendations for sick children, denying them care or medicine, which often led to preventable deaths from illnesses such as diarrhea. While some of her victims are known to be buried in Elwood Cemetery in Tennessee, Memphis, other children were never accounted for, and the exact number of deceased children remains unknown with estimates of over 500 deaths due to mistreatment. Could you imagine somebody just finding out you had a baby and they come up to your house and they tell you, I'm a CPS worker, baby's got to come with me. You're not a good parent. Give me the child. And they have a police officer and a judge backing them and they take your child and tell you you can call to check on that child. And when you call that number, it doesn't go through. Nobody answers. You never see that child again. Or imagine your four-year-old child's playing in the front yard and she pulls up and takes your child and leaves. You never see them again. Ever. At the time, so-called black market adoptions were not illegal, but were considered ethically and morally wrong. Reasons of the day included the fact young unwed mothers were often coerced to give up wanted children, the stability the suitability of parents was often hastily ignored, information about the child's heritage and medical history was lost, and adoptive parents were unaware of any physical or mental illness. The Tennessee governor of the time, Gordon Browning, launched an investigation into the society on September 11, 1950, after receiving reports that the agency was selling children for profit. He assigned Memphis attorney Robert Taylor to the case. Public Welfare Commissioner J.O. McMahon, McMahon accused Georgia Tan and her cohorts of receiving as much as over one million in profits. The Tennessee Children's Home Society was closed in 1950, but she received way more than a million dollars. Like that was all they could count for, but there was millions more nobody could account for. But back then, a million is like a gazillion to us. Now, back then, you know, $20 could pay your rent, your groceries, everything. So the aftermath. Georgia Tan is estimated to have stolen possibly almost 5,000 children on record. The number is on unknown off record. Just on record, 5,000, but off record. It was never enough for her, you know? This woman was said to have done more than 300 adoptions in one year. That is not normal. It's said that the, the a normal adopt like a person who does adoption normally does like five maybe six a year possibly possibly six a year she did over 300 nobody did nothing even for back then it just i it's just crazy to think that people would just you know was it could just let it go but not all of them did new york and california vowed to take action but the children's adoptions were never investigated and no children were restored. Georgia Tan died of uterine cancer three days before the state filed charges against the society, thus escaping prosecution. For her part, Judge Kelly was believed to be receiving bribes for ruling in Georgia Tan's favor. However, 1951 report to Browning by the Tennessee Department of Public Welfare said that while she had failed on many occasions to aid destitute families and permitted family ties to be destroyed. She had not personally profited from the rulings. She retired shortly after the start of the investigation and she died without any charges being brought out against her. So the judge got away with it too. Everybody basically. That really just disturbs me so much, dude. Somebody just, you go in the hospital, you have a baby, whether you're with your your spouse, your family, or you're a single mom by yourself, and you're in the hospital, you've just given birth. Back then, you didn't have the medicine and stuff like you do now. So you're hurting, you're in pain, you feel every part, every moment of this labor. And this bitch is going to walk in and take your baby just out of your arms. Or the nurse who's working with this bitch is going to come in and take this baby and then come back and tell you it died or just come back and tell me tell you that you're not capable of caring for this child so we took it you know how many fights were probably started up in those areas could you imagine because when georgia was first doing this 
she was taking a lot of children that were given to her. She was taking a lot of kids that were supposed to be giving up, that were supposed to have been given up for adoption, but that wasn't enough. Then she started taking kids who were, didn't have the best home life. Then she was taking children who were from poor families. You know, then she goes to taking children who are in, you know, middle class families who have food, shelter, clothing, good families. And she's taking, then she's going to take kids from wealthy families. Then she's taking kids just from everyone. She's stealing kids from everyone. You know, a man and a woman get into a car wreck and they die. So the grandma gets custody of the baby. She goes and takes the baby. But then she turns around and gives the child to another 70-something year old woman who can't take care of it for the money. You know what I'm saying? Just such a, a black market of child trafficking. It's, it's crazy. She never had to pay for any of this. She lived a lavish lifestyle. She lived like me there. So, Georgia, the judge, Kelly, the police officers, the politicians, everybody who was in her back pocket who worked for her or with her never got punished. Never had to take accountability for anything they did. They got away with all of it. But what we did get from this is the awareness that we can share to stop this from happening today. Because guys, trust me, this is still happening. There are a lot of underground adoption agencies that are out here selling babies and the really disgusting part of it is they're selling disability or disabled babies like hotcakes. There are so many families like that one YouTube family who just, they got that autistic baby and as soon as they had it for a little bit of time, oh, I don't want it no more. Here, just rehome it like a dog. What? What do you, and that's the kind of people that I'm talking about. What's their, let me find their names. Micah Stafford is the YouTuber who adopted that little baby and then turned around and rehomed it because they didn't want it no more. It was just too much. You know, after they made a lot of money by exploiting this child on YouTube in YouTube videos, you know, they exploited the shit out of this kid. And then once they were done and they were ready for a new kid, they rehomed this one. That was Micah M-Y-K-A Stafford. S-T-A-U-F-F-E-R. Faces backlash for rehoming adopted Chinese son with autism. And they have a couple other kids. And, you know, this is the thing. Stafford Mike is a mother of four other children with over 75 million views and 717,000 subscribers. And this article was some time ago um, on YouTube. Revealed in a video that her son Huxley has a new forever family that's better equipped to handle his needs more than two years after she and her husband adopted him. With international adoption, sometimes there are unknowns and things that are non-transparent on files. Her husband, James Stafford, said, No, and then they said, Once Huxley came home, there were a lot more special needs that we weren't aware of and that we were not told. That's a damn lie, first off, because Micah did a video where she said she wanted a special needs child, possibly with autism. She wanted it special needs, extra special. She said that so many fucking times, it made me sick. She knew she was getting a special needs child because that's what she specifically asked for with the adoption agency. And her and her husband picked through kids like they were picking a puppy at the breeder's house. Like they were going to the damn pet store to look at gerbils and hamsters and fish and shit. That's what Micah and James did. They went, they picked out their special child, brought it home. Two years later, after making tons of money on YouTube, then they decide, nah, we're going to rehome you and get a new one. We got these other four, you know, and they still are on YouTube. Ban their ass, YouTube. Get them off. Ban them and get them off. They're disgusting. Micah Stafford, deuces. I don't like you at all. I don't like Georgia Tan either. That's who you remind me of. You don't treat kids this way. You knew you were getting a special needs child. But see, it's people like the Staffords and Stafford's, or how the hell you say it, and Georgia Tan, that don't care about children's needs. They don't care about how they treat children. They don't care. And it shows.
And I can't stand that. And that's why I'm trying to bring awareness to all these situations. Let me get off that rant because that's a video for another day. The Stafford family on YouTube. How do you, how do you, look, how can you specifically ask for a special needs child with severe special needs and then get mad because he has special needs and then try to tell people, well, when he got home, I didn't know he had that many needs. Did you ask for a special needs child with severe special needs? You specifically asked for that in your application and you said that in your video and then well, that was just too many special needs. You don't get to pick and choose how severe a special needs child special needs are. That's so messed up. It makes me want to, ugh. And I hope that little baby, I hope that little boy, I hope he's okay. Let's get back to the Georgia tan. But I just want to say that's who Micah Stafford and her husband remind me of. They remind me of Georgia tan because of how they treat children. Like they're on the black market buying children, picking them out left and right and exploiting them for money and then when they're done they toss them out like trash i said it i said it over several decades 19 of the children who died at the tennessee children's home society due to the abuse and neglect that georgia sub subjected them to were buried in a 14 by 13 foot lot at the historic elmwood cemetery with no headstones Georgia bought the lot sometime before 1923 and recorded the children there and recorded the children there by their first names. Baby Estelle, baby Joseph, poor little babies. I'm going to cry. In 2015, the cemetery raised $13,000 to erect a monument to their memory. It reads in part, in memory of the 19 children who finally rest in peace, here unmarked, if not unknown, and all the hunters who died under the cold, hard hand of the Tennessee Children's Home Society, their final resting place, their final piece a blessing, the hard lesson of their fate, changed adoption procedure and laws nationwide. In her book, Rural Unwed Mothers, An American Experience, Maisie Huff makes the argument the Tennessee Implementation and Social Work Standards without providing the need funding contributed to abuses in the system. The Tennessee Children's Home Society scandal resulted in the adoption reform laws in Tennessee in 1951. Her custom of creating false birth certificates for adoptees, which she did to hide the origins of the child, became standard practice nationwide. In 1979, the state adopted legislation requiring the state to assist siblings who were trying to find each other. While a bill that extended this provision to birth parents did not pass, in 1996, the state of Tennessee enacted Chapter 532 of the Tennessee Public Acts of 1996, which revised the process of obtaining adoption records by releasing them to adult adoptees of Tennessee Children's Home Society upon receiving permission from any living birth parents. But even when they did that, the problem is Georgia changed the name and forged a lot of the information on the birth certificates. She falsified fraudulent birth certificates. So a lot of them, they can't find where they came from. They can't find their siblings, their parents. They can't find anything. They can't even find where, the county, nothing. It's just horrible. Georgia Tan adopted Hollinsworth on August 2nd, 1943. A legal provision that same-sex couples used at that time to ensure that their parents would inherit their property. Georgia Tan died in 1950 and was buried in her family's plot in Hickory Cemetery. Uh, set three days before Governor Gordon Browning of Tennessee filed charges against Georgia's home. The home was permanently closed in 1950. Why did they wait so long? Because she had so many people in her back pocket, I'm sure. That's why. You know, but... Damn, why didn't the governor do something before then? You know, people had made reports for years on her. They didn't just start that one day before she died. People made reports for years because she was kidnapping people's kids out their front yard. She was kidnapping kids out the nursery in the hospital. She had nurses piling babies up to give to her. You know, she had so many people working to obtain children for her. I mean, she was going in the grocery store 
and seeing, you know, your kid over there and would walk up and take it claiming she was a social worker. Ridiculous. Um, another story is called Missing Children, A Mother's Story, 1982. It was loosely based on the Tennessee scandal. Unsolved Mysteries had an episode from December 13, 1989. There was a movie called Stolen Babies, 1993. Um, she was featured in an episode of Investigation Discovery's Deadly Women, titled Above the Law, aired September 2013. Um, she was uh, the topic of a podcast called Southern Hollows, 2017. Baby Snatcher, April 30th, 2019. Behind the Bastards podcast, The Woman Who Invented Adoption by Stealing Thousands of Babies. Um, her name has been in a lot of stuff. In 1990, the LA Times published a story of Alma Sipple. Her daughter, Irma, had been taken by Georgia Tan under the pretense of providing medical care, but a few days later, however, Georgia Tan informed Sipple that her daughter had died of pneumonia and already been buried. Sipple was devastated by her grief, but suspected the child was still alive. Her efforts to find her daughter at the time, however, were fruitless. Years later, in 1989, she happened to be watching Unsolved Mysteries and recognized Georgia Tan as the woman who had taken her child. As the show suggested, she wrote to Tennessee Right to Know. She wrote to Tennessee's Right to Know, a volunteer agency in Memphis that reunites families with separated children by adoption. They soon found Irma, whose name was Sandra Kimball, and the mother and daughter reunited by phone. Simple story was featured again in the podcast Criminal. See. Even her name was changed to Sandra Kimbrell. So her mom couldn't find her all them years. It's just horrible, man. It just, it, man, it shows you that people can be evil. Money is the root of all evil. But this is a lot more than just being money hungry. Like she herself was abusive to the kids. One girl told a story that... <laughs> When she was taken, she was a child, about six years old, and her mother had willingly given her up for adoption. Her mother's new boyfriend did not like kids, so her mother decided it was best that she give the child up. When she called Georgia, Georgia had the mother bring the child to the mansion. Her mother said, go upstairs and play with the other kids while I'm doing business. When she came back downstairs, her mother was gone. She started crying and wanted her mom, and Georgia grabbed her and told her to shut the hell up, and from there she said it got ugly. She went into a home. She did not have the best life. Another woman tells of a story that Georgia came to their yard, and the little boy was about two years old, and the other child was about four years old, and they were at the backyard playing Georgia pulls up in her Cadillac and walks into the yard, picks up both children, takes them back to the car, and leaves. Mom is in the house. Another story, a man has three kids. He's a Vietnam veteran. He's a single father. He, you know, goes to try to get benefits because he, has, he can't find a full-time job, so he needs help financially. He goes, and they tell him, we'll help you get benefits, but in the meantime, let us board your kids. We'll get them medical care. We'll keep their food, get them clothes, you know, anything they need, proper schooling. We'll get it for them. And to, when you get a job, you call us back and let us know, and we'll give you your kids back. You'd think that would be a red flag, but back then, that was normal. Nowadays, you'd be like, uh, no. Back then, it was normal to board your kids until you got better or got financially more stable. He agrees. He gets to L.A., he gets a job. Within a couple of days, you know, about a week, he calls back. He says, hey, I have a job. I'm moving into a place. I'm coming to get my kids. Georgia Tan says, we don't have your kids. They've already been adopted out. He's like, what do you mean? You were supposed to just be boarding them until I get a place of my own and a job. You told me I had months. It ain't even been two weeks. Where the hell are my children? She lies and tells him they're gone. And they were gone, and they split them up. Another story says that a man, what was it? A man, no, no, a woman. A woman was in the hospital. She had just had a baby. 
She wasn't married, but she was engaged. Um, she did not live with her family. She lived with her fiance. He was at work. While he was at work, she goes into labor, goes to the hospital, having the baby. A nurse comes in as she's delivering, and they get the baby out, and she's fine. Nothing's wrong with the baby or the mother. While the mother is sitting there, the nurse takes the baby for a bath. Woman looks around, looks around. Hour goes by. The baby's not back. She finally calls a nurse. Where's the baby? She says the baby's died. She's like, what do you mean the baby died? She was like, the baby died. It's dead. It was stillborn. She said, it wasn't a stillborn. It was just alive. I just held it. You took it for a bath. You wouldn't take it for a bath if it was a stillborn. No, it died back there. She's what? No, it didn't. But there was nothing she could do. The nurse covered it up and fought and, and fraudulent, you know, she did paperwork and, you know, basically lied about everything. The woman never seen her kid again. Um, I'm trying to think of all the stories. Another woman um, had just had a baby. She had two more small children at home. <clears throat> Georgia Tan walks into the hospital and tells her that she is not capable of taking care of her children because she does not have a husband. This woman says, I have been doing just fine with my children. I'll continue to do fine. Georgia Tan comes back in the hospital room and takes her baby. There's nothing she can do about it. About a week or so later, a cop and Georgia Tan pulls up at her house and they take her other two children. They split them up. They go to different states. This woman died not knowing where her children were. This woman died with one possession and that was her Bible. And she had her children's birth names written in the Bible. It stuff like that just gets me, man. I I get so heartbroken. Even if I don't see it right from my face, I just read about it, hear about it. It, it just breaks me. I've always been that way. I know I look like a big baby, you know, because I'm so emotional and stuff. But it hurts. To know that someone went through that, you know, it, it hurts. Something similar kind of happened with my situation, but not quite. Um, I was a teen parent. I was a teen mom, very young. The person that I had child with was a lot older. And back when it happened, people, people didn't do anything. To protect a teen mom they looked at you like you were a whore even if you were raped or or molested or anything else they looked at you like you were the whore and that's how i was looked at i could not take care of a child i didn't have a job a home anything nothing and whenever the father decided that they wanted to be with someone else that they met i had no job no house no nothing so I couldn't keep my child. I had to make the decision to give my child a better life. And it hurt. Thanks for watching.